Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming by. So um, this is a recap or basically like a short summary of some of the papers of uh, iClear conference. It's been uh, it, it happened this year. It happened at the beginning of May in Vancouver. Um, and with all of the usual caveats, that this is just a single person's perspective, does not try to talk about everything. There's really too much. Uh, stuff at, at one conference to, uh, you know, for one person to uh, look at. Um, since it's been in May and some of the papers who are usually submitted to the conference were submitted in before that, then this means a lot of the work is beginning of this year. So by deep learning standards, it's ancient by now. So if you, like, uh, if, if you see something that there's clearly a new and upgraded result and stuff like this, let us know. We'd be happy to, to chat about it. Hopefully not all of this is completely outdated by now. So two words about me. Um, I work at Instrumental. It's a startup where we take images. So we have like stations like this where we take images from manufacturing lines and find defects and anomalies and, and discover defects on them. And it turns out that you, you can assist people to do it in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, before that, I added logos of the companies that I worked for. I tried to make a logo of what was the logo at the time when I worked for a company. So you can see like Microsoft has been a while ago. Anyway. But more importantly, let's let's dive into into iClear. The first thing that this is like a tradition of when you talk about a particular conference, first you need to show this very happy graph of how the exponential growth of papers and attendance at these companies. Uh, I'm sorry, at the at the conference. So I'm so the graph that I found ends at 17. Happy to report that 18 numbers exactly almost like 2x from the previous one. So it could, keeps going, going, going up. Um, iClear in general was supposed to be this little, tiny, cozy, comfortable conference. So, you know, like, you know, Jan LeCun and Jeff Hinton can like talk about the important stuff. Uh, since then, you know, when there's like 1,000 people, it doesn't feel cozy at all anymore. There's like a huge swarm of people. Uh, but it still tries to be like it's a single track and most of the time is spent on posters, not on oral presentations. So it tries to be cozy as much as it could in, in today's world, but it increasingly stops being that. There's like too much stuff going on. You can't look at everything. It's only kind of specific topics that you're interested in. So have a huge bias in the selection of papers. All right, with those caveats, let's dive in. So how many people know what GAN is? All right, very nice, very nice. So I don't need to do like a long series, but let me do like a very short poor man's version of what GANs is. Uh, GANs are gener generative adversarial networks. The general idea is you have a pool of samples, say images, and you wanna train a system that could generate novel images that look very, very much like the ones that in your set. And there's no supervision at all. You only have a set of images and you need to do this somehow. And the way, the exciting way to develop this was thought of by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. And the ba basic setup is, is called generative adversarial. What this means is, so there, we're training two models at the same time, a generator model and a discriminator model. And in the beginning, there is some noise vector the generator sees and its task is to turn this noise vector to an image. And at first, it's all initialized. All of the weights are initialized with noise, so it, it produces just, just some random noise. And then there is a discriminator network where it would see images generated by generator and images from a data set. It needs to learn to distinguish between them. At first, uh, it's really easy because images from data set are actual photos. And this is noise, so it learns really well to distinguish between noise and the, uh, and the images. But after it's learned to do this, you train the generator again. And when you train the generator, it has access to all of those weights of the discriminator and learns to trick this specific version of the network that can distinguish between noise and something else. And when you learn this, generator learns to generate patterns that would fool the trivial discriminator so it can no longer 
uh, distinguish between generated and a data set. After it's learned to do this, you train the discriminator again and then keep going vice versa. At some point, if you do things right, this will stabilize and discriminator will no longer be able to successfully distinguish and those images look like something realistic. And the goal here is if in the end a powerful system like a uh, complex neural network cannot distinguish between real and non-real, maybe we were able to generate something decent. This is the main, the, the general overview. But I hope a huge percentage of, of, of you already knows this. So the way it started is the original paper uh, from 14 were able to generate faces like this. So those are real and those are generated. So you can see how noisy, but there's something there. This is on CIFAR 10, where this is like a dog or a horse, and it was able to generate this, which is not particularly impressive. This is the first paper that introduced the approach. Um, in 15, it got to something like this, to, like to generate faces uh, better, but you know. Um, so we're gonna talk about things that, uh, that happened on iClear to advance this forward. One, one uh, notable paper is spectral normalization. This is one of the few that I think are implemented in, uh, I think the recent version of PyTorch includes this, so they actually made it to the, to the practice. Um, the idea that this paper, the main idea of this paper is, um, we know from the previous work that the main condition for the stability of training those systems is discriminator. Like a lot of the magic is in, is in discriminator, is in this part of system that tells good from fake. And uh, to get good results, discriminator has to be very smooth. It has to like very, um, in, in a very smooth way, react to changes in the image. And this, and if you if you have discriminator like this, then uh, it it provides enough signal for the generator to produce good images. And what was explored before is the Lipschitz condition, which is a special condition on how much the function output of the function can change with a tiny change of parameters. And like this, this Lipschitz condition, bounding it was proven or shown that uh, it increases the stability of the training. So the realization of this paper was that, that what they, they're proposing is for the linear layers, turns out that this, uh, the, the, the critical number for this condition equals to the um, first um, uh, SVD decomposition value for the, for the largest singular value. And they basically directly divide all of the weights of the discriminator by the largest singular value, thus achieving a tight bound on the continuity. And the, the kind of the technical contribution of this paper is to how do you backpropagate through finding the, the largest singular value. And they show results, how this can improve. I'm not sure if how, how much you can see from the projector, but tigers are still not very impressive. And some of the fire trucks look better and better. Um, we'll have time for question, but if you feel there's something burning, then raise your hand, then I'll try to answer as is. Um, the more impressive result is we probably a lot of people see is also from iClear, and, and this is the, the paper that was submitted. It's called uh, Progressive Growing of GANs. Um, those are uh, 1024 by 1024 images of people, and those are all generated by the network by itself. Uh, those are novel, so it, this is generated from the celebrity data set. There are no celebrities that look like this. And you can see that uh, some of them, some of them close to perfect, some of them maybe not quite. So this, like, this is, I think, handpicked just a little bit. But in general, it, they have a larger, um, well, larger selections and, and a lot of them look really good. So the main trick of w how they were able to do this, and this is like the main contribution, is so-called progressive growing. And what this means is um, the way they train this large system like this, they start with generating just by four by four images. So they make a GAN system that generates four by four image and nothing else. After, it's, after the training is stabilized, they add two layers here, all of them convolutional layers that generate eight by eight and train it um, 
to both generate 8x8 eight eight and still generate 4x4 four four if you remove them. So they always train to that the network should generate uh, a better copy with, uh, with the next resolution and the previous one at the lowest resolution. And after this one stabilizes, they add another one and then trade 8 by 8 and 16 by 16 at the same time. And after a lot of the steps, they get to 1024 by 1024. And this is how they were able to achieve the result. And basically, the scheme is, is to stabilize the training. So the network first needs to uh, learn how to generate the low resolution high, uh, like high level details, and only then gradually refine them to a very, very tiny detail of the pixel level. They use other tricks than that, but this is the, the main contribution. Um, more fun results is the images from different categories. So you can see like a lot of them look really, really good. Like images like bottles and bridges and cars and well, cats are, you know, animals are hard. Uh, the fun example that everyone points out is one of the images with cats. Like a lot of the images from the internet are lol cats with captions. So it tries to generate captions. Uh, it's, they're not readable yet, but give it a couple of years. All right, so this is the, this is the GAN, GAN track. Um, another interesting um, development that, that was fun is, uh, and like still generates a lot of the talk in the community and a lot of the work, is the problem of adversarial examples. So adversarial examples is something that we found in 2014, and by we I mean the humanity, um, that there's this intriguing property of neural networks is that if you add very specific small noise, this changes their prediction in a huge amount. So those are images that are correctly classified uh, by like a modern network, uh, by uh, like a bus or a temple or something like this. But if you add this noise, which will transform them like this, they're all classified as ostrich. And we, we have algorithms to generate this kind of noise and um, we, for a while, struggle to find the solution and it seems that for any kind of network, you can generate a noise that will produce this, like will significantly change the, the prediction. Those are called adversarial examples. Uh, in time, um, there were like people thought about this as a, as a security problem and there was some ideas of maybe you can demonstrate it if you can change the pixels, but if it's in the real world and you, and you take it through the camera, it will not work. Uh, it was uh, demonstrated in, in 2017 that it will still work. Maybe the distortion is big, but adversarial examples work even if you print an image and you take it through the, through the cell phone camera. Um, then we discovered that you can make a special patch that you can put anywhere in the photo, and as long as it's in the photo, it completely changes the, uh, what, what, what's predicted. So seems like, it seems like it's not an easy problem. It's not like there's a, there's a quick fix for this. So the work uh, on, the, on the iClear that makes some progress on this is, uh, well, one of the examples, there are a bunch of papers, but obviously I'm selecting one, is uh, characterizing subspaces using local in, in, intrinsic dimensionality. And the, the, the thought behind this paper is um, their explanation of why adversarial examples happen. And the, their postulated theory that, well, we all know that when you train a deep network, then um, the layers of the network learn how to untangle the uh, space in a way it's semantic, right? So in, in the beginning, it's just pixels. And as you go through the layers, it tries to unwrap the, the space so, it's in cl so, it, so the different classes or different useful things are better separated in it. So things that are close in the space are things that are semantically close to each other. So cats are together with cats, dogs are together with dogs, as opposed to in a pixel space. And the explanation is that while when you do this unwrapping, then this process inevitably leave, leaves pockets of empty space in those high dimensional spaces. And inside those pockets, you can find, uh, like always find some spaces that's not uh, covered by your source examples, 
where it's not clearly what, what the behavior is, so it's random. So you can always find a pocket that satisfies you know, the, um, the way to trick the network. So there inside of what you can do about this is to look at the dimensionality of those pockets. And what, what's meant by that is uh, one way to estimate the local dimensionality, the, the intuition is to check how, how many samples you have when the radius is increased. And uh, so the intuition is, for example, in 2D space, if your the, the, the radius of, this, of the circle increases, those, the number of samples that fall into it, I mean, meaning its volume, goes roughly in a quadratic way. In a three-dimensional, it goes in a cube way. In a more, in, in the higher the dimension, the quicker the volume grows based on the size of the, of the hypersphere. And this means that for an, any particular point in a space, you can check how many neighbors from the real data set I have and how much the number of them grows when I'm increasing the distance. And when it grows really rapidly, this means I'm locally on a high dimensional, uh, in a high dimensional space. And if it grows slowly, then this means I'm in a, like locally I'm in low dimensions. And their main insight is that for adversarial um, examples, this local dimensionality is much higher than for normal. And using this, uh, uh, using this property, you can distinguish between adversarial and not adversarial. And this is an example. So around the normal example, as you grow the number, uh, like as you, as you grow the radius, the uh, other examples, like other samples of the data set, come in very gradually. And for the adversarial, there's nothing, nothing, but at some point, it, like, you, you start getting a lot of them, which points to, to that uh, this one locally lies on a high dimension space. Sorry about this. And based on this, they, based on collecting that, that density estimation from multiple levels, they train a classifier that can classify adversarial from non-adversarial. The any time you come up, you think you come up with a way to test for adversarial examples, the next thing you have to do is to apply you, uh, all of the methods to produce adversarial examples to your end-to-end -end system, right? So you should like back propagate through this whole feature thing uh, to check if maybe your, your system were able to detect existing adversarial examples, but it, does it have Dif uh, adversarial examples of its own. And they did that, and the result is they were still able to detect with like 95 accuracy. So only 5% of the like existing methods produced uh, like f were able to fool it 5% of a time as opposed to 99% of a time for all, like for a lot of the previous approaches. So the exciting thing about this is this does not fully solve problem of adversarial examples, right? Maybe there's, there's just a new, smarter way to generate them that will even fool their system. But the, the exciting part is it moves the problem to cat and mouse game. In a, in a lot of the security applications, the best you can hope is cat and mouse game, meaning that there are some known methods to, to find uh, vulnerabilities, there are some known methods to protect against them, and you, you just need to like keep up. Whereas previously, we had this universal method to find adversarial examples, worked all the time against all defenses. So it seems that there is, there is progress. How's the, like is the content feel good? Mo good amount of detail? Okay, all right. There will be time for questions. Um, so another, an, another topic that's kind of discussed uh, is do adversarial examples even matter? Like what are, the, uh, what are the cases where being able to change a few pixels in a way human will not notice, but the machine will make a difference? Um, an example would be 
like the, 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 like the, the, the question raises from the fact that if you can change small number of pixels, usually it means you can change a large number of pixels as well. And if you can change large number of pixels, you can always fool anything, right? If you fool a classifier that you want to like make a classifier think it's a banana, just show it the image of banana, right? There's always a, a trivial way to fool. So like it's not quite clear what would be examples where it's important that you fool the machine, but you don't fool the human. Like for example, people are worried about the medical space, right? When uh, like maybe because of the adversarial examples, we would not find the tumor or something like this. It's not clear, like, if you have an intrusion system that can change pixels for patient data, you can just remove the tumor. You don't need adversarial system to do this. And if you do it for yourself, it's not clear what's the incentive. Anyway, so there's like a discussion, like a meta discussion of kind of revisiting how important th this problem actually is. All right. Uh, another track that I wanted to talk about is uh, papers that talk about um, efficiency of learning. Like we all know deep learning needs a lot of data and uh, it's the da this data is hard to come by and hard to label. So methods that try to make us more efficient data-wise. And there are different perspectives on this. Here's one. Um, one setting is so-called domain adaptation. And the problem goes like this. Say we have some labeled data in one domain, say NIST digits. So we know that this is eight, two, five, and five. And but we would like to apply our model on different domain, like those SVHN house numbers, where we have a lot of data, but we don't have labels for it, right? So imagine you train on this, but then you need to perform well on this. And one of the, one of the approaches is called dirty. Um, and basically their, their idea is they, they have two components to their system. One is, so the, the uh, images here are, this is some space where the samples are. Those are your initial classes. And those are classes of a new domain that you don't have data about. So you have data about this, but not this. So the first thing that they do is they have a special addition to the loss function that pushes this boundary decision of a classifier right in between, like in, in between those, uh, those two sections. So it really pushes them away from the points of, the, uh, of each of the classes, so it's in this empty space. So this is the first thing that, we do, that they do. After this, they use this classifier to uh, generate pseudo labels on those unknown things. So classify them based on what that classifier says, and it, as you can see, it's really not perfect. After this, they apply this procedure again and push this, this line away from the, from the new points. So they maybe push it a little bit towards the empty space. Then they relabel again using this updated classifier. And then they push that again too. So and after a couple of iterations, they arrive to this classification boundary that happens to work well for even for new unseen data. And the specific numbers that they have is they, they demonstrate 76% accuracy on SVHN while only having labels about MNIST data. Which is, I mean, really impressive, right? The baseline is 10%. If you don't do this, this mechanism that, that uh, your prediction is pretty much random, so it's like 10, like, uh, 10 or 11%. And with this, you can get it to 76 there were other papers about the domain adaptation, so it's like a, uh, if you're interested. What is the method that's pushing the, what do you say, the cutting plane? Right, right. so the question is what, what is the method that pushes uh, cutting plane in the middle? They have an addition uh, to loss function that penalizes heavily so-called entropy of the, um, uh, of the distribution, meaning that it, it, it penalizes if the uh, probability um, that you like from the softmax is um, in between, so it really pushes pushes it to the extreme conditions. So it, 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 it the probability should be either zero or one, and it penalizes it if it's if this probability is 0.5. So either you have a very good hit or a complete miss. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Question. So could, could this be used to improve the training of the model to understand the 
even when you have training data, you're not really covering the whole space. Do they show that this could help results in standards? Yeah, it seems that like when they show that the uh, addition of the slows function and regular training does not give you much. Yeah, there's a question. How does it know when to stop? Because you don't have any later data sets to actually calculate the entropy again. Okay, so how, how would not swing in the other direction and collide? Yeah, the question is how do you how do you know where to stop? So it should not swing to this, right? If they if it swings too much into this direction, the loss function will put, push it away from that as well. So it really moves to the like tries to move it to the middle. But in practice, they just have a fixed number of iterations. They like they do it for five or ten iterations, something like that. All right, let's keep going. Good questions. Um, another interesting setting is so-called memory-based adaptation, and the problem that they tackle, I think this is paper from DeepMind, is um, any time that the, so we train the model and then we run it on some real data. And every time you do this, the real di distribution of the real data will not be the same as training, right? Just inevitably, it, like it very quickly diverges. And the, the current solution to do this is to get more data that's more realistic and retrain the model. And this retraining is an expensive step, an expensive operation. So they're trying to make it uh, make the model adapt to the distribution that it sees. And the way they do that is, uh, first they train model as usual. Like this is like the path of, of training the model as usual. But uh, for the data from the training set that they see, they store embeddings of, of this data with the class that they have. So they remember some amount of training set in terms of what were the embeddings and what was, the, what was its class. And during the testing, they uh, update this library of the recent examples with the stuff from test, with the stuff that they've seen data on, uh, with the ones that you were able to label. And when they produce output, they basically, instead of just uh, running the model, they run the model until they receive this embedding, and then they look at, uh, for the incoming sample, how does it compare with the memory, and do basically majority voting based on what are the most similar uh, examples in memory. So an example would be if you have like a classifier with, with five classes, uh, first you train the classifier, but then you have uh, enough representative samples of all of those five classes, and when the new sample arrives, instead, like you would look at what is the sample most similar to from the uh, library of the classes of the examples that you have, and take the majority voting of a classes there. And what it, this gives you is uh, you can update this library based on test time. And this will change the decisions of this network without having to retrain it. Make some sense? Hope it does. Say it again. How do you know how to change, make the change? You have to train that. Uh, so when you change, you just update this library of examples that the network has. You don't retrain the whole network. But since your library changes, then it will affect decisions of the network because your new examples will be checked for similarity for the new library, not for the one that you had before. All right, so final one, I'm not even, I'm, I'm not willing to hand wave and, and explain this, but there's this uh, a field of meta learning or learning to learn um, where basically uh, we're trying to learn systems that are good at learning, which is like, could be like too meta, but, um, and I don't know, the, 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 the quick overview is what this picture means is imagine that you're training a system that should be good at fine tuning, giving new data. So it's not, should not be able to just solve one task, but given additional data should solve new tasks. And turns out then you can rephrase it as, so those are the parameters of the network, to bring it to some point that given new data could easily go uh, to uh, parameters that are optimal for a particular task. 
So you can formulate it as a meta-optimization problem that um, will train a system that then are better trainable for specific tasks. How do they train the system that trains the system? Uh, with gradient descent. <laughs> it's always the answer. OK. Um, so another section is kind of new standard blocks uh, for deep learning that could be used in many different tasks and improve the, uh, uh, the performance on many different things. One is uh, that I think it's got the best paper award. Um, is update to um, popu like very popular Atom optimizer. So Atom is the gradient descent optimization methods that is often a default of what you try when you train a deep network. And a uh, quick recap of how it works, it's uh, designed to solve so-called uh, saddle point problem where the regular gradient descent basically swings back and forth for a long time before it finds the right direction to roll out of the saddle. And the way Adam fixes it, it penalizes the, it has adaptive learning speed for every component, like every, every dimension, and really penalizes the learning speed for the gradients with the high, um, with the high value. So if you're going to some point with a very high speed, it would say no, go slowly. Um, and if you're going to the particular uh, direction with a low speed, then go there faster. And what the way this solves this is it is able to amplify the slow but consistent direction to get out of uh, saddle point and to uh, reduce this chaotic, non-productive, but very fast gradient on, on, that, on the slope. And th like this is the code for it. It basically a, a rolling average of the gradient squared of the uh, the norm of the gradient, and uh, the, like learning rate is divided by this accumulated thing means that if for a particular direction accumulated is large, then the learning rate will be slow. And so this is like well known, very standard, uh, very standard method, and uh, uh, this paper um, on convergence of Adam and Beyond uh, explores the particular corner case where they think that could be could hurt the convergence of atom. And the specific corner case in question is imagine that you have a loss function that uh, most of the time is just minus x, but 20 out of like one to uh, in, in, in uh, one twentieth of the case is actually 20x. So like very chaotic function where it's usually almost everywhere it's minus x, but very rarely it spikes in the opposite direction. And you can show that the optimal solution for, for this problem is minus one, and it turns out that Adam cannot find it. Because it has a rolling window of the, of, of the size of the gradient, this turns out that the spike always screws it up and it finds a very suboptimal solution. And they have some, uh, some vague thoughts of they think that this could happen in practice, that like in practice when you uh, have large softmax in particular, something like this could happen. Like you have a very it's like rare class that sometimes well, like wants to generate a big gradient, then uh, you, you get into this mode. And they propose a, sw a very, uh, there's two ways to solve it, but one of them is super simple, uh, is to basically cap this max size of the gradient in Atom. Or basically just to say that your learning rate cannot go up, it can only go down. It turns out that this is enough to stabilize the training and uh, get Atom to converge on, 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 on this case. So they propose just this little uh, maximum addition to, to Atom to solve this problem. And they show that for some other uh, tasks it, it kind of helps. I don't think that this became mainstream yet. So what is Adam short for? Uh, what is Adam? So it's, it's adaptive something. <laughs> is, it, is there even a short for? I'm not sure if it's a short for. Does anyone know? I think it came before E. <laughs> good, good luck. Adaptive application. All right. 
So another another one of the building block in a standard building blocks. It's like it's 2018, and there's still marginal but small progress on ConvNet architectures. Uh, it used to be older age, and every year there's like VGG and then ResNet, and then uh, well, and it, it you can see how the low hanging fruits are taken more and more, and every year the progress is smaller. And there was just one paper on the improvement, like proposed improvement to ConvNet ar architectures, and it's called DLA. And their, their, ba ba their takeaway is um, that there should be shortcut connections from higher, uh, lower blocks to higher blocks, but you don't have to do them all the time. So uh, they do this in a hierarchical uh, blocks where lower ones uh, send uh, send data to significantly higher ones. So this is similar to DenseNet, but in, in a in a much uh, I guess sparser way. So DenseNet uh, sends all of like every everyone sends a lot of the things in a uh, like a lot of the connections to the uh, blocks down the stream, and this one is very selective about how they do it. So they try to kind of uh, be more efficient in terms of connections. And their, the, every building block is, is either a usual ResNet block or this is like ResNext block. And they demonstrate like a small uh, improvement as a, as a base model on the usual ImageNet tasks. They've been prom like they promised that by CVPR they publish the actual weights and, and more thorough exploration of their uh, architecture. So if anyone's following ConNet architectures, I would be I would enjoy hearing if that actually happened. But you can see how the the gains are are becoming marginally uh, less and less. But there's still some progress. What else? Oh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, uh, at least on iClear, there's less activity than usual. Um, just uh, so for, for people to remember, reinforcement learning is a, is a task where there's an agent that interacts with the environment, and based on the rewards from the action, should learn the optimal policy to extract maximum of rewards. Uh, this is the field that brought you AlphaGo and victory in Dota and weird movements of the simulated people. And um, so the interesting thing that was on, on iClear is uh, new tasks. Let me, can I start the video? I hope I can start the video. So the idea is uh, the, how interesting of a policy you can learn depends on how interesting the environment is. And one way to make environment very, very interesting is to add a competitive element to it. So here, two agents compete uh, with, the, with the opposing goals. Right, this is like kicking the ball. I think there's a case, yeah, see, so sometimes. And um, the cool thing about this is um, there was not a lot of supervision happening. So there was some first episode where they were learned to walk, meaning the, the, the explicit rewards were given by the fact that, you know, the humanoid just stands and not falls. And when it moves to the ball, but after this initial training, all of the reward became whether can you complete task or not. And the rest is really end-to-end -end moving the joints uh, training. Another fun example that they had was the sumo. And for example, like all of those behaviors of charging into opponent were learned. So they were, they were not programmed at all. Uh, the stance itself like the stable stance that's harder to uh, to topple over was also learned. All right. Um, there were some interesting meta behavior. Yeah, so sometimes they fool the opponent. So if the op opponent charges, you step away and, and the opponent falls. Um, and again, so like the the cool thing about this is not a, like there there's no engineering around it. It's really just the richness of a competitive behavior that gives rise to uh, like very different ways to behave and 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 to uh, move around in the space. Okay, can I? Right. Uh, another w reinforcement learning domain that was not much I've, I haven't seen much explored before is the communication. Uh, I guess there was like papers from from DeepMind and you know the crazy system that they had to stop or whatnot. 
Um, but here, um, what, what's being explored is uh, there are two agents communicating, and one agent, for example, sees a particular image um, with the object of a color of a particular shape and needs to communicate it to the listener, and listener out of many uh, images, or some of them are distractors, need to identify the right one. And they communicate through the discrete protocol. So speaker, for example, for images, both speaker and listener are convnets. And speaker needs to transform image to a sequence of, of steps, like, a, uh, like a, a sequence of, of data of the fixed size. And listener needs to predict, based on that, what's, uh, what's the right image and trained end-to-end -end by reinforcement learning. And basically what they're uh, interested in is does the language emerge from this? Uh, and the way they define it is does the, uh, those messages, do they have compositional structure? Meaning that there's like sub messages that talk about different things or is it like for any combination there's just a unique word? And they have some interesting results that, um, so this is like different games with the, the, the different number of distractors. And you can, you can see how depending on the size of the distractors and how hard the task is, the lexicon size is very different. So, and lexicon size is just a different number of different utterances that uh, um, agents uh, can produce. And, if this task is very simple, they quickly uh, converge to, here's a unique word for every situation. There's no language or structure to it. One, one generates it, another one picks it up. But if there's a lot of distractors, like there's 20 distractors, they actually have a big lexicon size and um, they, um, they have some topographic measure of, the com uh, of how composable that is, which was very, um, like, I should have put it. Uh, it's a not exact measure. It's it's more of a uh, it's more of a like very early indicator. Uh, but the interesting thing is, um, in all of those cases, agents learned to solve the task, right? So they they can predict with like ninety something percent probability. But only if the task is difficult enough, properties like language uh, seem to occur in the communication, which is interesting. Okay, what I, what I have, oh yes, the, the final section that I wanted to talk about is basically applying deep learning to all kinds of problems. Um, so it's, it's less about kind of novel uh, improvements on existing algorithms, it's just applying it to, to ever, ever larger number of tasks. One example of this would be spherical CNNs. I think it's also got, got the best paper award. Um, and the idea is um, some, some, of, some amount of image data comes in a spherical form. In particular, I think some of the medical imaging or, for example, the astronomical images, they always come, always come in spheres and geographical data when it's a globe, right, it's a sphere. And it turns out uh, that, well, not turns out, it's widely known that you cannot map a sphere to a plane uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that does not cause a stretch. Right? You cannot unwrap a spherical surface on the plane to, for example, if you have a spherical data, to use, to use a regular CNN on. And this contribution is uh, generalizing a notion of CNN and convolution layers on a sphere w that has all of those nice properties of being uh, equivariant across the sphere. So for example, if you do any kind of rotation and run it through convolutional, through, through their convolutional layers, it's exactly as, uh, like, exactly the same rotation uh, of the features. And they, they employ some, some uh, impressive and, and uh, elegant math to, uh, to make all of this work. And yeah, the fun thing about them is one, one, uh, they said one of the problems with the approach is there's no MNIST to test on. So they made a data set called spherical MNIST where this is MNIST digits mapped on a sphere and this was the first test. Nice touch. Um, another one is um, uh, a blueprint of how do you do end-to-end -end differentiable web search. One way to think about the, all of this uh, deep learning stuff is you have a lot of standard blocks that can solve different tasks, 
And this is kind of a new way to do programming, a new way to do engineering, right? Like the uh, usual engineering is uh, like programming is, is basically expressing a real world problem in terms computers can understand, right? This is, this is what programming is. And this is new way of programming is expressing a problem as a way, as a number of differentiable label uh, layers that you feed the data and train on them. And this is how you solve the problem. And um, this, is, this is a system that tries to do this end-to-end -end with web search. And what they have is they have a model that uh, transforms a query into a particular embedding and documents in a particular embedding. And based on, the, um, based on the query vector, they do basically a dot product with all of the document vectors, which produces a relevant score. In addition to this, based on the query, they predict what would be a next query that the user types. Because usually when you use the web search, it's not like one session. You try one thing, then you try another thing, and another thing. And they use it to, based on the query, try to predict what, what would be the next one uh, to try, and I think they do autocomplete for it. And basically, given just the documents and the logs of a search system, you can train all of this end-to-end, -end, right? So you train both embeddings to, to have the query and to have a document and to even predict the next thing that user types. And this is kind of a sketch of how in, in this new world you would make Google. And I'm sure Google has a prototype of this already. Okay, so the, uh, another domain that I wanted to mention is a product recommendations. This is a paper from Amazon. And usually for product recommendations, not a lot of people are using deep learning. And um, for, for their case, it's really, they want to do straight up product recommendation, meaning you have millions and tens of millions product at Amazon. And I think they do for books at Audible as well. And you have some history of what user bought before, and you want to predict what will, what will they uh, buy in the future and recommend things. And they have metrics about, first, how, how often they're right, but in addition to this, additional loss functions about diversity of the product that you cover. Because like a really, really easy way to, to uh, be right is to just predict the most popular products. Uh, but so they have additional metric about th what's the coverage of all of the products that are being recommended. And they train, like this is the full architectures of the network. It's a two layer, fully connected network. Um, the trick here is these layers are really 10 millions of rows. Like this, uh, the, your input and outputs are, are tens of millions. And of course, this will not fit into memory of any single machine. So they use the Amazon's, uh, they have like their own machine learning framework called Destiny um, that specifically works for this kind of tasks where you have like a huge model with a huge number of, of neurons and you need to subdivide this to multiple GPUs and, and, and train on it. And they, they produce like results that obviously beat the previous system, otherwise they wouldn't publish. But it's exciting to see that uh, like you, with enough data, you can use deep learning in a domain that traditionally was not using that at all. So the partitioning is custom to Amazon. You said they partition the domain with several processes, right? Oh, the, the question is if it's proprietary to Amazon. No, this, this framework is open source. So if you, like, if you had the data that Amazon had, then you could, you could try to run it. Okay, what is the exact algorithm? Is this simple loop propagation or backdrop? What is that? Person? Yeah, so, so the question is what, what is the model? Uh, it is really just a two hidden layer uh, neural network, nothing else, nothing fancy at all. And those are really one hot encoding, encoding of whether user um, bought this, this product or not, and it needs to produce what would be the products that user will buy. It seems like an auto-encoder picture, right? Because you're connected to those images. Uh, so it's not quite like auto-encoder because you're not predicting the itself. Uh, but they, they do have things about they want to predict even the, uh, the products that, so if the user bought a particular product, they want to predict uh, like the, in a target data that's also one here. So it has like properties of autoencoder as well. Like, so it, it has to predict both the products that user bought before and the, uh, like the products that, that user bought in the future. 
And this, they do this to increase the diversity of the results. There's a question? Uh, so the question is, do, do the uh, outputs really uh, correspond to products? So if they add a new product, do they need to retrain? Yes, that's exactly the case. And they, I think they retrain nightly. So like every, every day they retrain a system like this. But this is like a research project. So for a research project, I, I were not able to get a definitive answer if they have it on production, which probably means no. But yeah, but uh, with the with the enough scaling, they they retrain. They they said they can retrain in like during the night for all of the new data. Okay, so the final one that I wanted to mention with the applications of deep learning, you start to see papers about uh, from neuroscientists more and more on a on a conference. And this particular one that I really liked was um, trying to um, make a simulator for the moth brain and not for the whole brain but there's a particular insects where we know a lot about how neurons work there and they take the smelling system of a moth um, and everything that we know about how it works and, and runs in a simulation but instead of um, detecting odors they give it handwritten digits from NIST so they they take a system which is our best understanding of how moth or like smell system works and train it to recognize um, NIST digits. And this means there, there's no back propagation. Uh, all, everything is either by, by simulated chemical phenomena or by the neural plasticity, meaning that if it, if it fires together, it wires together. And here's, here's the results. So this is the number of training samples that the system is exposed to. Green is, are, are the usual machine learning methods, SVMs, CNNs, and stuff like this. And the important one is the moth. Like blue is, is, their, uh, like this is the result I think that we should pay attention to. And the interesting thing is it gets to 70% at one. Like if you just give it one example of each digit, it gets to 70%. And if you go up, it doesn't go much f up from there. And I had a discussion with the author. The author come from neuroscience, not from machine learning. So this is like, all of this is, is, is the, the, the new thing that they do is to train it with NIST uh, to be able to compare. The rest is like the, the neuroscience research. And uh, my kind of statement was that if you show me a graph like this, I would argue that there's not much learning going on in the system that you created some feature engineering and you gave it one example, it remembered what it was and just does a, a, a comparison. And if you give it more, it doesn't go up, means it's not learning. So it's just you come up with a clever feature engineering. And it, it could be some truth to that. Like imagine that, you know, during the evolution, all of this thing is basically feature engineering. There's like the system is not learning much, but uh, basically the goal is uh, like, Moth will not survive to see 50 samples. Like, it, it needs to start working from one and two. And if this is your constraint, maybe your only hope is the, is the feature engineering and what this is what nature is doing. This is not definitive at all. This is like just one, you know, couple of person discussing interpretation. But it could be that like the way, um, the way we end up with the, with the neurons and whatnot is in a very different setting. Like right now we're working through a system that given a lot of data and a lot of resources can get to the good result. But the way kind of nature had to get there is just starting with extremely small number of examples which is still a property of humans, right? When you, humans can learn from a very, very small number of examples. So, that's all I had. Is it, is it possible that it happens but at a much longer time scale and the, the angle of the improvement is very low? So the question is, uh, could it be that it happens on a much longer time scale? So here, the difference between red and blue is exactly the time scale. So red is if you show this example once. So like there's there like the, this all of the plasticity and learning uh, has small time to like long time to kick in. This the blue one is if you have just one example but you show multiple times a lot of times repeatedly. And I kind of suspect that if it was going up much 
high, like much further up, they would show it. But for, for, for mods, that happens over many generations. We have many thousands and thousands of years uh, transferring the, the learned learn capabilities and uh, so the, the question is for moth that happens on a multiple generations well I don't think so so like I, as in this this is simulating a single moth uh, seeing the examples so all of this is simulates a life for one moth and so one uh, confirmation that that kind of that we ha have for this is it's known that moths are able to remember three or four others max like they, they cannot remember 20. All right, thank you. Um, do we have time for questions? Okay. In the back. Just curious about the moth example. Is it possible to uh, is it possible to uh, emulate the evolution and introduce some noise to the neurons and see which neuron composition would cause better learning? Uh, so I think we barely able to emulate what the moth has right now. I think like emulating evolution is is just you know this not something we we can do. And keep in mind that this is like a very very small part of the moth brain. This is just the order system, and we know a lot about it because it's easy to do experiments on. Or, yeah, oh, there's a question here. I found your um, report on the language learning book so interesting, so that in a game setting, mm -hmm. the agents start to learn some language from phrases. So it just reminds me of uh, part of the research in the cooperation community, so evolutionary cooperation and fishing mechanisms. And they also talk about exactly similar games, so like Prisoner's Dilemma and other kind of games for learning languages. And they also show that communities that learn languages survive much better than communities that don't learn languages because they have much better kind of in terms of transmitting information. It's really great that also not only the evolution community, the biology community is studying, it's also sharing same community science. Yeah, I think like multi-agent games are like a, a very uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, way to to learn what could what happens when like the value of coordination and, and things like that uh there's the you know open ai famously works on on dota and they're gonna have like a match against professionals soon which is very exciting and one of the one of the things they talk about is the main it seems that where the computer teams beat human teams in in their approach is coordination meaning that like if you have five people playing dota everyone is still like obviously you work for the good of the team but it's really hard to resist to land last hit on a mob or like buy some item and stuff like this and it seems that computer teams are much better at like not being selfish and even in the small like a tiniest details you know written like not having this temptation to you know to improve your hero as opposed to everyone else so for the spherical example that you showed which is for the spherical example, the domain that you showed, mm -hmm. uh, what was the constraint on the data? I didn't understand for ray casting. They said it, this works only on certain kinds of data. Is it symmetry around the center or what did the image have? Yeah, so the, the constraint is only that's really the data is on a sphere. So data is not like a um, two by two, like the two dimensional image, but mm -hmm. it's collection of spherical points. And it doesn't have to be symmetric, doesn't have to be anything else. It's just, you know, when, when your data is a sphere, imagine this is like a map of mm -hmm. the globe, mm -hmm. right? And you want to run like detection on it. They can do it in a way that's symmetric to the rotations and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Like a, a choice of uh, of topics of, so, um, I believe you, uh, there are just from top of your head what uh, two or three more papers that you omitted in this presentation. Sure. Um, so um, 
what what was what was particularly fun. There was a fun paper about, uh, and it's just a t clever twist on the data uh, about um, summarizing um, Wikipedia. And the, the idea that they had is so there's like a model that does text summarization. And the way they train it is as an input, they feed all of the references of a particular Wikipedia page. And output is the first paragraph of Wikipedia. And this is just a clever way to have the data that you have to formalize for a summarization task. And like, and the best model that they find is a transformer uh, with like attention and, and stuff like this that was actually generating a lot of times good looking summaries. Uh, so that would be one. Another was there was there a, something particularly crazy that that I omitted? Uh, people do more and more do clustering with deep learning, which is another uh, interesting topic for me. Uh, like in a completely unsupervised manner, you, it turns out you can come up with a reasonable loss function that is able to cluster. And unlike a lot of the other clustering algorithms, resistant to the number of clusters. So like you, you say, um, I want to cluster with 20, and it actually uses just three, because the rest is not useful. I know, there's, there's many more. <laughs> Hard to choose. Hmm? Oh yes, the capsule nets. Uh, there was a single paper on capsule nets, which was about EM routing for capsule nets, um, and which, which is like a better way to do routing than the, the, the thing that they had before. And yeah, I mean, th there, there is a single paper, but you don't see a huge amount of activity around it yet. So um, typically in... Uh, the neural neural nets it's not possible to you know justify why it is giving certain results and uh, i think that there were like some mention that some work is happening in that direction was there anything yeah so an interpretation like interpretability i don't remember anything in particular uh yeah there there could be some some ways to um, like come up with the architecture that's the output is 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 more interpretable, but I, I yeah I don't remember any particular uh, interesting developments on that. Going back to the question of clustering, like uh, like what what were your thoughts or what were your uh, learnings about clustering in very high dimensions? So the, the papers that did clustering and, and things related to clustering, they did start with images. So images like is extremely, like the pix like pixels are extremely um, high dimensional data. And it seems that they were, there's some limited success in, in applying that. Could you repeat please the title of the paper about using something like library of samples? Yeah. yeah. So I'll try to publish slides somewhere, and, and and like all of those papers have links. But let me let me find. Yeah, memory-based adaptation. Is there is there a place where I can post the slides? I'll I'll comment on the on the meetup. All right. Feel free to grab me afterwards. Thanks for listening in. It was like a lot of stuff. Yeah.